Shalonis Ahsoka more like Clone Wars and Rebels than The Mandalorian is? Mm Mm-hmm, we like that. Hi, let's take a quick look at the first two episodes of Ahsoka. And before I get into that, do let me know how horrible my Yoda impression was, because I've done this more than just once publicly, and some went, yay, and some went, no, 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 no. Set after the fall of the Galactic Empire and pretty much continuing where Rebels ended, Ahsoka is Disney's attempt at bringing the narrative of all its Star Wars themed shows together while also laying the groundwork for Filoni's upcoming live action movie that is meant to conclude the overarching story of the Disney Plus shows. Considering how all over the place most of Disney's Star Wars shows have been though, that seems kind of a tall order for just one show to do. And as Favreau mentioned in an interview with Entertainment Weekly, as we're getting deeper and deeper into this, you start to have to really map things out. Wait a minute, you're starting with that now? With that said though, the first two episodes of Ahsoka paint a good picture and feel a lot like a continuation of Dave Filoni's work on Clone Wars and Rebels. He still seems to grasp what makes Star Wars Star Wars and how he can translate that and the animated characters into a live action world. While the episodes feel a bit dragged out, the world building is very well handled and does a good job of reintroducing the audience to this world and these characters. And the cast carries those wonderfully. Rosario Dawson and Ray Stevenson in particular carry a level of calmness and authority you associate with a Jedi, which was sorely missing in shows like Obi-Wan Kenobi. And David Tennant is fabulous as the logical droid Hu Yang, with board Dizo Sabine Wren being the only character that may end up being a narrative burden. And the overall visual presentation is pretty sound as well. The art design is the suitably retro futuristic Star Wars you have come to know, with some technology looking ridiculous by modern day standards, but that's unlikely to ever change. The only negative I have to say is that many of the sets look somewhat empty, and just as in pretty much all Disney productions, many of the costumes and some of the head props, like those on Ahsoka's and Cindula's head, look like cheap rubber, making it look like cosplay. I wish they would at least add some CG on it to make it look more like skin. And all of this is lens in a practical but unspectacular fashion. The lighting is very naturalistic and, well, practical, and it all looks suitably Star Wars, but there's nothing particularly special or standout about it. And the same thing can be said about the blocking, which does its best to incorporate world and character elements, but is restricted by the onset limitations of virtual productions. But it still manages to create some stunning vistas and visual atmosphere. And the score does a lovely job of underscoring all of it. It ranges from romantic adventurism to more sinister and mysterious pieces, whenever the Sith are on screen. It has its own style though, which still fits under the acoustic soundscape of the franchise. As your master, it's my responsibility to prepare you. I won't always be there to look out for you. I could use the help. Once a rebel, always a rebel. Don't be afraid. In conclusion, Ahsoka seems to be a faithful continuation of the world Filoni and Lucasfilm created with Clone Wars and Rebels, and is actively trying to bring some desperately needed structure into Disney's overarching Star Wars narrative. I'm genuinely looking forward to the upcoming episodes, hoping that the show picks up its narrative pace, while also aligning the stars in this war, which is Disney's attempt at managing this franchise. I will certainly be reviewing the season when it comes to a close in October. But that's it from me for now. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you in the next one.